I'm from New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, I am a PhD student um, in my fifth year, finishing hopefully in May, uh, researching how students use internet resources for learning, like more informal internet resources. Okay. Studies have actually shown that the that students turn to the internet as their first source for you know anything, it, both educational and personal. So you know when you're sitting and having dinner with friends and they say. Um, you know, oh, so-and-so was in this film, and you say, no, he wasn't. You know, what, the first thing you do, you pull out your phone and you go to the Internet and you try to prove the other person wrong. And when we give students assignments, we know the first thing they probably do is go to the Internet and Google it because that's just their baseline. You know, even if you tell them to cite scholarly sources, if they don't understand the subject, first they're going to try to figure it out using resources, and then they'll find things to cite that support what they finally learned. So um, I was interested more in that. Um, in fact, my daughter uh, was taking physics, and she was struggling with homework. And this is kind of where the the idea originated. And um, I, you know, she said, "How do you do momentum?" I'm like, I don't remember momentum. It was a long time ago. So we went to Khan Academy, and we watched two videos. And I'm like, "Oh yeah, now I remember." And she was able to go off and do her homework. So. Um, you know, I was interested in, in how our students, you know, we, we know they're doing it, we're trying to not admit they're doing it because we're saying they can't learn, it's not, those resources are unreliable, they can't learn from them, I think they can, I think they do, and we are just kind of overlooking it and saying, no, no, it has to be scholarly, it has to be, you know, a formal resource. Um, so I, I recognize that there are open educational resources that, that are also very good and, and students may use them. But there's also, you know, like students who were researching um, databases went to Oracle. They go to the source, they, and they follow different branches to try to understand what it is, you know, whatever it is the assignment involves. So what I talked about in my presentation was um, I started out with, you know, a little bit of the background. So I used Bloom's Taxonomy to create assignments that require students to research things on the Internet, but I specifically tell them don't use, you know, scholarly journal sources. Don't go, you know, to what what are the approved sources, so to speak. Um, find things that you feel are reliable. And I know people say there's all kinds of garbage on the internet, which is absolutely true. But um, my experience, from what I've seen, the students find is they they can tell the difference, and they're very good at saying what is garbage and what is not. So I didn't see things like, you know, just some random person's rambling blog. They went to um, if they were like one of the classes uh, researched the Target security breach, and so they went to Target. They went to things like Business Week, um, you know, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and so they were finding actually very reliable sources on their own. Um, so, you know, in addition to creating these assignments and I'm capturing all their resources, and you know, so I, I get their grades on the assignment. I also get their resources, and I don't know if you're familiar with social network analysis. Not, okay, so it's a really cool visual. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have it, but um, I basically create, you know how you've seen those networks of people. So I create networks of students and their resources. And then I'm trying to understand, you know, because you would think when students come into, you know, they, they all start at Google, right? That's everybody's default search engine, at least at, at my university. So they all started Google, and yet they're finding a lot of different resources, which I think is very interesting. So then, you know, now I'm trying to tease out, um, are the students who are finding the more unique resources spending maybe more time, they're more engaged, or, you know, are the students who find the common resources doing just as well as the students who are finding these unique resources? So I'm, now I'm applying social network analysis to these student by resource networks to try to see if there are any patterns that emerge in terms of um, how they do on the assignment and where they are in terms of the network with their resources. Yes, definitely. I mean, I have a lot, actually. <laughs> uh, it's a dissertation, so there's quite a few. In terms of the social network, I'm looking at um, what's called exclusivity, so that would be the more unique resources and seeing if that uh, correlates at all with their grades. Right now, it's not which I think is interesting because I really thought it would. Um, I'm also looking at um, what they call in-degree centrality. So in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, if um, 
I, the students do an individual assignment and then they share their resources and, and answer the same questions as a group. So for the resources that they found individually, now I also look at was that one of the resources the group also cited? And I'm trying to then see if that makes any difference. And, and in fact, it, preliminary results are, are showing that the students whose resources were cited in the group tended to do better individually. So now it's kind of a question of chicken and egg. Is it that the group knows they're the stronger student and are selecting their resources? Or were the resources good, that's why the student did well individually, and therefore the group chose to use them. So now I'm trying to tease that out. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's a very... Um, I'm hoping to, um, number one, show that there are ways to integrate more informal internet resources into learning. That, you know, I, I mean, even in the sessions I've attended, everybody, everybody is still saying, oh, you know, we'll use open educational resources, but we won't just let them use anything from the internet because it's all garbage. It's really not all garbage. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of garbage, but there's, there are a lot of very good sources, you know, professors who are altruistic and decide to create, you know, videos about supply chain management and just post them on YouTube, you know. These are subject matter experts and just because it's not posted in some formal place or in some formal resource doesn't mean it doesn't have a value, you know. So I think students can learn and, and that also then opens up learning to more people who may not be able to afford you know, any other, any formal kind of education to developing countries or people, you know, who, who have no other access but have access to the internet. You know, that maybe there are ways that we can help them learn by just using the things they can already find for free. You know, I think just um, the, the whole concept of information literacy, you know, I, like I, I say, you need to trust the source, you need to feel that it's reliable. So if somebody actually reads, you know, Joe's blog and thinks that Joe knows a lot about it, you know, then maybe we need to work with that student individually and say, why did you think this person was reliable? But, but I, I have to say, generally, they really did find reliable sources. The only, I mean, like sometimes I would see them cite um, other, you know, uh, what is that website? Um, Scribed, I think it is, where, or SlideShare, where people yes. share, share their presentations. So I've seen them cite some of those, which, you know, you don't know the source of that, right? It could be a student, it could be a professor. You have, really have no idea. But, but if they're sharing, if they're citing that, but they're also citing a very reliable resource, maybe there was just a hole in that reliable resource that that slide share complemented. You know, so sometimes they just need to hear it a different way. So I think in general, as long as all of their resources aren't garbage, as long as most of the resources are good and reliable, even if they have to pull something from somewhere that you would say, oh, that's not a reliable source, but maybe that one little piece you know, because I, I know when I do research on the internet, a lot of times I have to find five or six things to get the whole picture, because this one focuses on this aspect, but it doesn't make sense to me. I need to grab the other thing to make, you know, to kind of get that complete picture. So I think it's okay if, if that one unreliable thing, you know, doesn't, doesn't you, you may not think it's good, but it somehow helped them. Or, or they just found it because they, you said you needed six resources and they said, oh, here's number six, you know, so <laughs> that's hard to tell, but <laughs> hopefully that's not the case. Number one, say, you know, trust the students, that they are actually very good at filtering the resources. I would like to add a component to my research where I could have expert raters look at the um, URLs and, and, you know, say, is it relevant, is it helpful, is it reliable? I don't have time for that, but um, but I, I think students actually are generally very good at, at filtering it on their own. I really didn't see any garbage. The other, I think, benefit is that I actually saw students, say we have a large international um, master student population, I saw students who were linking to Chinese websites. So they're going to, you know, a, a language that's more comfortable for them. I saw students who were linking to YouTube videos. So these may be people who are more visual learners and don't want to read something. They would rather have a video that guides them through it. So I think it, it addresses that whole issue of personalized learning as well, is that, you know, the student can find the thing that, that really helps them understand rather than the resources, you know, 
I mean, I've read scholarly paper, papers and some of them are great and some of them I have no idea what the person is trying to say, you know. So, um, you know, sometimes forcing that down their throats, they're not getting anything out of it. You know, you can say they read a scholarly paper. Did they actually learn from it? Probably not, you know, unless maybe they were able to find supporting information that made it something that works for them. Yeah. You know? I think some students are are um, very literal. You know, they're they're super. Their understanding is superficial. You know, so we're trying to get that deeper learning. Um, so, for example, um, forcing them to read about the TJ Maxx and the Target security breaches, and then compare and contrast them, kind of forces them to to move higher up. You know, rather than. Um, so I think a large part of it is really the assignment, but also, you know, maybe guiding them to say, you know, you need to think about um, how the two companies are related. Like, I think some of them just say, oh, here's TJ Maxx, here's Target. I understand what happened in each, but they have a hard time seeing the overall similarities and differences. Uh, and that could just be a maturity thing. I, some, I, I am doing the research in undergraduate classes as well as graduate classes. So the undergraduates sometimes have a little more trouble with that than the graduates. The graduates tend to generally do well on that. So. Use taxonomy of cognitive learning outcomes to um, look to create the assignments. So um, I use the five levels. Knowledge, you know, is just repetition. So I don't really. Um, that's hard to capture. I mean, how you know how can you really capture that? So I start with comprehension. So. For example, with the Target security breach, you know, I, I started with, you know, explain Target's business and IT strategies because this was an information systems course. Uh, then, you know, in application, um, how does it relate to their overall strategy? Um, and then, you know, comparing and contrasting, <clears throat> moving up, and then finally evaluating, um, comparing Target and TJ Maxx, which had a large security breach several years earlier, and saying which company responded better. So um, things like that. So I'm using the cognitive learning outcomes from Bloom, but I'm also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, using, I don't know if you're familiar with the National Research Council. It's an organ, a large organization in the US. Um, so they've kind of come up with um, a modified um, skills, competencies for the 21st century learner. Uh, like, you know, that we're supposed to all be lifelong learners. So they have a cognitive component, which is similar to Bloom's. They have a intra, intrapersonal component, which is similar to Bloom's affective state. But then where Bloom had the psychomotor, they have um, interpersonal, you know, so kind of reflecting this need in the 21st century to be connected, to work with others, to collaborate. And so I'm also trying to capture that by looking at the interactions of the students and how they communicate and how they share resources and things like that. So, so Bloom figures into it mostly for the um, creation of the assignments. In, intriguing but, but uh, dismal results uh, in the sense that I've asked students to collaborate in the system so that I can see what they're doing and I, I was hoping to code their interactions. They're not. They're talking face to face. They're talking, you know, <laughs> they're they're talking in class, or they're, you know, they're meeting. They're sending via email, or they're, you know, doing a Google Hangout. They're doing something that I'm not seeing, um, but I know they are collaborating because they are submitting the assignments, and they are, uh, in many cases, taking the resources they cite and and um, refining them. So, in other words, if the if each individual student had five resources, and you have a team of five. There are 25 possible resources they could cite. Most teams, though, end up citing six to eight, you know, in the final group project. So, so clearly they're somehow filtering, they're talking about things. And I've seen a little bit of that, but I think a lot more is happening behind the scenes. But I also um, ask them, as part of the, um, the survey that at the beginning of the assignment, have they ever shared before? And I ask them how. So. Um, a lot of students have shared face-to-face, -face, but a lot of them do say they've used um, Facebook. Almost nobody at my university, anyway, has used Twitter. I don't know why. But um, a lot of them do actually share through Facebook, or you know, one student said, I actually post things on Dropbox, and I just share it with all my friends, and I just put things in there, and they can use it or not, whatever they want. Some students, a few, will share through the university's um, learning management system. Um, some of them don't want to do that because the professor sees what's shared there and so they feel that that's kind of a barrier to sharing. 
but but they are sharing you know so so it, I think there could be a problem because in the class they're not collaborating with their friends so I think they're willing to collaborate more openly with their friends when it's kind of forced on them it's a little more of a struggle so um, I do capture if they allow me to because in, in the US we have to get a separate um, consent form to get their grade so they don't all provide it but if they do I'm allowed to get their grade on the assignment so I can actually see how they did and I can also get their GPA for the semester so I can then kind of cross-check to make sure you know this is an A student but they got a C on this assignment maybe then there is something wrong with it maybe maybe the, the resources they found were not good enough you know so maybe they needed more guidance or something but but generally as far as I've seen right now they all did actually pretty well on the assignment um, it's it's more a um, pulling things together issue you know that some of them just have that hard time of of the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, you know, so they're able to find the information, but they can't quite put it together yet, you know. Um, so maybe they need more guidance in that sense. But but I am trying to explore the outcomes at the individual and the group level by getting the grades for their assignment.